human rights uh, groups, Human Rights Watch, and uh, uh, have all urged authorities to invite international experts to conduct an independent investigation into the blast. They argue that casualty figures could be significantly higher, raising questions about why stockpiles of explosives were being stored in a populated area. Joining us now to share a little bit more on this story is US-based human rights lawyer Tutu Alicante, who's a native of Equatorial Guinea. And he's one of the, he's the executive director of uh, EG Justice, the world's first NGO focusing on human rights, rule of law, transparency, and uh, civil society in his home country, Equatorial Guinea. Thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. It's a tragedy what's happened uh, in your home country, but when you heard the news, did it surprise you that something like this could happen? Honestly, it did surprise me, because one thing we did not suspect is that the government of Equatorial Guinea was stockpiling explosives in the middle of the most populated city. Normally, you would expect a responsible government to stash weapons away from civilians. Normally you would expect a, a government that does stockpile weapons or explosives near civilians to let them know, to ensure that the military, the soldiers in a military barrack do not have their children and wives there. And that's not what happened. So I, I have come to not be surprised by anything that my government mm -hmm. would do, but the callousness, the reckless disregard for human life here does surprise me a bit. And one would have thought, I guess, that uh, after what happened in Lebanon, that uh, Equatorial Guinea authorities would have said, look, we have a potential situation here, given what's happened uh, in Lebanon. And in fact, that's what you would expect from a responsible government. I think what 40 years of rule by one of the most kleptocratic regimes and one of the most authoritarian individuals, Teodoro Biang, has taught us is that we should not to expect the unexpected. We should know that this type of behavior is going to happen. When you have your son who does not have a high school education as the vice president in charge of defense, we should expect something like this to happen, you know. So it, it, in, in that sense, uh, it is according to the plan that this government have. Rather than qualified people, what we have, you know, is family members. It's complete nepotism. And that's what you get when instead of qualified individuals, you have your son and your family members running the government. Will anyone be brought to account here? Because if these are authorities... Uh, storing these uh, explosives, it's hard to imagine that uh, the authorities themselves will, will do this. I mean, I, I'm seeing statements that they blame the explosions on fires set by farmers living near the military base. Well, uh, in any responsible government, again, you know, you would have what is called command responsibility. The person in charge of making defense decisions here is the vice president in charge of defense, which is Theodorin, the son of President Obiang. He should be the one, first and foremost, held responsible for the death of well over 100 people that they have announced so far. That is not going to happen. Theodorin right now, the son of the president, the vice president, is, uh, has been convicted at a trial in Paris, has been the subject of uh, anti-corruption cases or corruption cases in France, in the US, in Switzerland. And in many of those cases, which have been uh, demonstrably clear that he was fraudulently taking money from the resources of the uh, from the uh, treasury of the country and taking it to other places in none of these cases has anyone mm. brought any cases against him inside the country you know he is not prosecutable inside equatorial guinea so we do not suspect he or anyone else for that matter will be prosecuted here in this case do you think that the numbers that are being quoted uh, uh, understate perhaps the number of fatalities and those injured uh, we have received audios from rescue workers, from members of the rescue brigade in the military, who tells us that just within the three hours that she was in her staff, they recovered 81 bodies. And her, her, her shift was 
perhaps the fourth or the fifth shift. And after that, there were several shifts and there were shifts coming back the next day, which was yesterday. So we know for sure that there were over 100 soldiers living in that uh, uh, military barrack. And all these soldiers had family members, children and wives. So we suspect the numbers are much, much higher than the 105 that the government have reported so far. Do you have any sense of how people in Equatorial Guinea are feeling about uh, this explosion? Often what can happen is when you have an incident like this, all the feelings about everything else start to come to the fore. And it makes sense. It would make sense that uh, given such a tragedy, uh, our first and foremost concern would be with the surviving children who are now left without parents, or the surviving spouses who are now left without uh, a loved one. And our heart goes out for all those that have lost family members, close or distant. Um, most people in Equatorial Guinea are devastated, are devastated by the loss. But most people in Equatorial Guinea should be demanding accountability. We have to ensure that this type of this type of tragedies do not happen. Uh, what last year we had this in Beirut. Four years ago we had this in Congo Brazzaville. So we know what can happen when weapons are stored among civilians. And the government of Equatorial Guinea should be held to account. Every single one they have lost a home, they have lost their land, they have lost family family members should be compensated here. And every single civilian right now in Equatorial Guinea that lives near a military base should be told what weapons are inside that base or inside that barrack. You know, they should know what risk they're exposed to and whether they should move. Because if this has happened now, it's happening in Congo Brazzaville, it's happening in uh, Beirut, chances are it will continue to happen. And what sort of messages are coming out of the presidency at this time? Um, this is a president that for 13 months did not have a positive message for uh, civilians suffering from COVID, suffering directly, uh, having contracted COVID or suffering because of the economic downfall that the country suffered. They did not respond to that. In this case, given the massive uh, scale of what we're dealing with here, the government has come and just offered platitudes. Everything is going to be okay. We are going to take care of you when we know that once the cameras are away, once the international awareness is shifted to the next crisis somewhere else, the government will go back to what it normally does, which is ignore the rights and the liberties of the people. We fear, I fear sincerely, that the government would use what has happened here to further restrict, to further curtail civil liberties in Equatorial Guinea. Why do you think that uh, these uh, curtailment of uh, civil liberties uh, in the country has been allowed to go on for so long? Uh, does the government rule with a firm fist, a firm hand that people aren't able, are able to demonstrate, aren't able to uh, demonstrate uh, against uh, uh, what's happening? Yes. So the reason civil liberties are likely to be further curtailed you know, is because the, the, we're supposed to have presidential elections this year. At the beginning of the year, they were hoping they were going to announce the elections by now. They still haven't announced it. Um, Obiang is aging. The president is aging. And if you follow politics in Equatorial Guinea, you realize that Theodorin, his son, is now the one that is parading in front of the TVs, giving all the announcements, talking about what the government will do and we want to. Uh, what that signals to many of us, you know, is the likelihood that Theodorin will be the next president. And they know that most people in Equatorial Guinea are opposed to such a, a dynastic uh, a change of power because we are not a dynasty in Equatorial Guinea. And because they know people oppose that, they are likely to shut off internet whenever it's convenient. They are likely to set curfews early and early in the day so that people are not able to meet and gather and organize. They are likely to ensure that you know you cannot communicate abroad, you cannot send money abroad, all those different things that would allow Equatorial Guineans to be able to organize and ensure that Theodorin does not become anointed as the next president, the government will shut off all those windows and all those doors. A lot of people may be wondering how a country that is so oil rich 
we'll have so many people living below the poverty line? Uh, there is one word answer, and that's corruption. Equatorial Guinea is, unfortunately for us, a, an authoritarian kleptocracy. And what that means, you know, is that those that are in power are not there to govern. They're just there to enrich themselves. Self-enrichment is the goal, not governing, not providing electricity, not providing schools and hospitals. How is it that the richest country in the region, the country where the highest GDP per capita in the region does not have hospitals. And right now, many government officials are seeking help, are seeking medical assistance in Cameroon for COVID. How is it that in the face of this strategy, we have to wait for Spain and other countries to send in uh, uh, Band-Aid and alcohol, ethylic alcohol and all these different things that, you know, a country where the GDP per capita the Equatorial Guinea has should have those things. How is it that we do not even have a blood bank right now? Now is the time where we're in the midst of a COVID pandemic, the government is calling on citizens to come and donate blood. You know, so there are all these different things that, you know, one can sum up by the word corruption, absolute corruption to understand what's happening in Equatorial Guinea. Is the military fully behind the president then? Because in Africa, generally speaking, you stay in power uh, at the pleasure of uh, the military sometimes. I wonder with an incident like this where soldiers have died, does the sentiment change a little? Um, the vice president in charge of defense is the son of the president. The minister of defense is the brother-in-law of the president. This is Theodorin's uncle. Um, and so every single general in the uh, Quato Guinean army are members of the presidential family. So the chances in an institution where you listen to the words of your authority, you take command from whoever is above you, the chances of any sort of revolt within the military are unlikely. We citizens, we are now working to organize people, to organize Equato Guineans, including the military, to understand that, you know, it is upon us Equato Guineans to reverse what's happening in our country. And in a context that we have right now in Equatorial Guinea, everybody suffers, everybody loses, except the presidential family. All right, so getting back to the explosions and the stores of this uh, military uh, equipment, is it possible that there could be other pockets of uh, uh, explosives being stored in other parts of the city and other parts of the country? We are calling for a complete and thorough investigation of what has happened there in Bata, because just in Bata, there are at least two more barracks, military barracks, uh, and we need to know what uh, projectiles or what weapons, what artillery uh, remains in those places. As a result of the blast, one of the things that's happened, you know, you have projectiles all over town. Um, just yesterday on the news, on the national news, uh, the military was out recovering some of those and they have recovered, I think, 21 of them yesterday. Uh, and there have been images on, on WhatsApp of citizens, young men, they have found these projectiles and were carrying. So we don't know, you know, whether the risk of further explosion remains in Bata alone, right? And then you have to look at the other military bases or the other barracks that they have in Malabo, in Riaba, in Mosola, and all these different places and see what dangers are people exposed to in the vicinity of these barracks. All right, that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, thank you so, so much indeed uh, for joining us uh, uh, via Zoom all the way from North Carolina. And uh, we wish you and the people of Equatorial Guinea um, some peace after this tragedy and uh, hopefully also that things will change and uh, uh, fortunes for the country improve. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this time this evening. Thank you very much for the solidarity. Thank you. All right, that, uh, this is a sad story of uh, at least 105 people killed, and that number could be much more, uh, according to human rights groups, uh, that uh, were killed as a result of explosions of uh, uh, military equipment and explosives uh, in a city in uh, Equatorial Guinea.